uh, evolutionism and creationism and all the questions that, that brings up. And then, of course, this fall we'll be going back to the chronological study and we'll start in with the New Testament and we'll finish out the Bible that we started last year. Uh, in regards to that Russian tape, that's all raw footage. That's not been cleaned up or anything. It's, uh, I cut out about six or seven hours and reduced it down to about two hours, but taking excerpts from it. And uh, so just, it just shows you all kinds of things about the Bible distribution program, the orphanages, hospitals, and the interviews with people and the pastors and different churches. We traveled out to, I think, 17 different churches in the state and looked at all the buildings that have been bought by believers here in Kentucky and renovated by believers in Kentucky and Georgia and North Carolina and Tennessee and different places. Bibles bought by many by this church, churches in Laurel County, Oklahoma, many places. But what we want to do today again is to continue our thing here about evolution and creation. And that both of them are religions. They're both isms, evolutionism and creationism. They're both isms. They're both philosophies. They're both religions. They both take faith. Uh, neither one are scientific, neither one can be subject to the scientific uh, method of experimentation or anything of that nature. Uh, uh, anything you read about evolution in a science book is uh, uh, just really a heresy to science, to be quite honest with you. And uh, even though we claim to be creationists, most of us, most of us use evolutionary talk and actually have beliefs it's so built in with us that they come out without us even realizing it. And that's the reason why the little books I showed you last week for children, the one on ants, started off millions and millions of years ago. The ant was just like the ant is today. Well, right there is a violation of evolutionary concepts of survival of the fittest and adaptation and things of that nature. But that doesn't make any difference to them. They're out there to exhort their ism. And then the other one on dinosaurs started out millions and millions of years ago. Dinosaurs lived on the land, you know. And uh, we'll talk more about those later when we talk about dinosaurs. Uh, everybody seems to be interested in dinosaurs. All the children are. Being there, carrying all their little dinosaurs and things like that. And dinosaurs are just part of God's creation. They did live on earth with man, and they still exist with man today, in case you're not aware of it. A uh, Japanese fishing boat, 1977, caught a seagoing plesiosaurus in a fishing net. It was photographed. It was looked at with a marine biologist. A picture was taken of it. The picture is available. It's very hard to find. And, uh, but anyway, the evolutionists, when you show them the picture and when you uh, give them the evidence, they say, well, it's just the remains of a whale. They, they refuse to even consider it because they file it off in the area called an anomaly. Anything that does not agree with evolutionary theory is filed away as anomaly, such as gold chains in coal lumps and iron pots in coal, polystratified trees, petrified trees that go through many, many layers of so-called geological time. Because all these layers in the mountains are supposed to be laid down hundreds of millions of years apart, how in the world can you have a, uh, a tree that's petrified that's sticking up through several layers? So we'll talk more and more about that. But just how old is the earth? We're not sure. The evidence, if you really subject it to scientific experimentation, you can get the age down as low as 7,000 years and you can get it up as high as 35,000 years. And uh, carbon dating is the one that gets it up to 35,000 years because carbon dating is only reliable to 35,000 years, even using evolutionary terms. That does not mean we've been here 35,000 years. It just simply means carbon dating is only accurate for 35,000 years, if we even had 35,000 years. Uh, the 7,000 years is based upon the nickel content of the ocean because the microspheres coming in, the micrometeorites, the so-called cosmic dust from the Big Bang, uh, they come in at the rate of four ten thousandths of an inch per year and they're 70% nickel, therefore the ocean should be just covered up with nickel. And we should have nickel content laying all around the surface of our Earth, and we don't. Nickel is only found in certain deposits, like gold is, like uranium, like any of the other elements. It's only found certain places under certain circumstances. But you write, this nickel should be everywhere. Well, we don't have it. We only have about 7,000 years worth of nickel. That's as much as we can account for. Well, we talked about many things like that. Uh, it's impossible for the Earth to be millions and billions of years old because we don't have that kind of time. And last week we talked about how that the microspheres and how the magnetic uh, disintegration of the magnetic field and, 
And all these different things uh, point to the fact that the earth is a very young earth. And in fact, having a very young earth would uh, simply agree with the Bible. Well, as you know, creationism and evolution both get something from nothing. Well, that's a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And it's also basically a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the hydrogen cloud implosion theory is a violation of Newton's laws of motions and violation of the gas laws in physics. In other words, you say, how in the world can you have a theory that so permeates all of our textbooks and teaching and everything uh, when it's based upon falsehood. Well, the reason you can have it is because it's a religion. Religion has been introduced in our public school system, and we do not have true separation of church and state because the church of the atheist is in the school system and evolution, anti-God. In other words, naturalism. This is not science we're talking about. This is a battle of religions in the, in the school system. And uh, that's what the battle is. It's a spiritual battle. It, it's not a thing of the Constitution or separation of church and state. Uh, that argument will not even hold up, and even the justices know that. The none living to the living. That's a violation of cell theory. Cell theory says you only get the living from the living. Only cells divide. Only cells have life. You must get the living from the living. You cannot just have the living spontaneously arise. So therefore, evolution and creation both violate cell theory. But you see, the problem is in evolution, you have violation without a creator or without a designer or without a pattern, but you, you get all this complexity and beautiful system based upon simplicity from nothing. Whereas in the uh, creationism, you have a creator God who divinely and sovereignly, magnificently and majestically decided, if that's what God does, decides, I don't know what God does, but brought into existence this creation. And he took and just took some dirt of the ground and he breathed into that and he brought into being living human beings. After he had created all the other living things, then he brought into uh, existence uh, human beings and he said human beings were very good where he said that dogs and cats and all that and the stars and all were good he said human beings were very good and don't forget that in the creation account it says let us create mankind in our image both male and female created he them and you look at those pronouns there and they they will teach you volumes about God well it's very complex yet it's very simple do you know that everything that's living is based on four base groups held together by a ladder of phosphate and sugars? In other words, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And the rungs on the ladder, four base groups. Four simple uh, chemical compounds known as adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Those four, just those four things give rise every difference in every person in this room. They give rise to every difference in every animal and plant uh, in this entire created system. Just four things. Because those four things dictate the very essence of my body. And in fact, we're told in the scripture that God is the one that decided to formulate that DNA a certain way. And that DNA was perfect before Adam and Eve failed. That DNA was still in good shape even after they failed, except for the fact God said you're going to die. He didn't say you're going to get sick and, 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 and age and die. He didn't say that. He said you're just going to die. That's the reason they lived eight and nine hundred years. But after the flood, he brought in accelerated aging because he removed the water canopy above he removed the natural filter for ultraviolet radiation and now the ultraviolet radiation has been penetrating the atmosphere of Earth ever since the floods about 6,000 years ago. So we've got the effects now of about 6,000 years of genetic breaks in our DNA. And that's the reason we have all the diseases we have. It's the reason we have all the retardation problems. It's the reason we have all the handicap problems. It's the reason we have all these things and our blemishes and our wrinkles and, and all this aging process has come about because of the lack of the water canopy which we lost at the time of the flood. 
And uh, so living long, long time, you know, eight, nine hundred years, uh, that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people have ballyhooed the, uh, the scripture about because of the fact that how could a man live that long? We have to struggle to live 70 or 80 or 90 years. Uh, you know, I want to remind you of something. Men used to live to be quite old before the Middle Ages when a lot of disease and pestilence started and then the life expectancy went down to about 35, 40 years. However, before that, man was living uh, quite uh, long uh, life expectancies. And uh, the reason that we don't reach into eight, 900 years is because of genetic breaks and all the accumulation of the problems. But back in those days, they had no hospitals, they had no physicians, they had no drug stores, they had no respiratory therapists, they had no physical therapists, they didn't have any of these things. And they seemed to have done all right. Now, what do we have? Just here in just our city, how many pharmacists do we have? How many physicians, dentists, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, all these different things to help us to do what? To live to be how old? 60, 70, 80? And, and even with all that, what happens in the 80s and 90s? Age catches up with us. And uh, that's simply a uh, reminder to us. Age catching up with us and us getting old and aging is simply a reminder of the flood. The death of the human body is simply a reminder of the fall. That's all. But the eternalness that we have of our Holy Spirit reminds us of our creation. The fact that we speak different languages reminds us of the uh, tower experience. And so everything around us today, if we just open our eyes and realize it, remind, God is trying to remind us of how he has dealt with us in the past. Because you see, the way God dealt with man in the past is the way God will deal with us today. And it's also the way he will deal with man tomorrow and next week, and next year, and the next 10 years, ever how long time lasts. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the God of creation is the God of today. And the God of creation, the God of the day, is the God of things that's going to come into being after this creation passes away. And the reason this creation has to pass away is the same reason you and I have to pass away by our spirit leaving our physical body. We have to leave this sinful fallen uh, body that has a death sentence on it, has an aging sentence on it, has a sentence of speaking different languages and all that, we have to leave this behind because it's, it's a sinful thing. And not only that, uh, but we're to take care of it. The body's a wonderful thing. God says that in the scripture also. He made us, you know. And so we have, we have all these reminders about what God has done for us in the past. And that same God is the God today, the God tomorrow, and he will continue to take care of us. And when our spirit simply slips out of our body, we do not die. I will not die. I am not going to die. My physical body is going to, you know what's going to happen? My spirit one day is going to say, you know, Bill Poff, that body of yours is just not fit to inhabit anymore. I think I'll just slip out. And it just out comes my eternal spirit and somebody's going to say oh did you hear Bill Poff died no you don't believe it when you hear it you just when, when they tell you I, I died you say no I didn't his spirit just slipped out because he said his body wasn't good enough anymore he just wasn't fit to be inhabited you know well let's keep going now there's theory here you know we've talked about this this evolution five kingdom system however things started something from nothing down here on the bottom of the chart something from nothing then of the non living to the living to the one cell without a nuclear membrane one cell with a nuclear membrane the fungi which don't know if they're plants or animals and the animals and the plants and of course the animals right here man comes off of the animal see and that's taught everywhere it's taught in kindergarten, it's taught in daycare, it's taught the Discovery Channel, it's taught in the A&E, it's taught on the History Channel, it's taught in the grade schools, middle schools, high schools, universities, colleges, postgraduate studies. No matter where you go, it's in all the tech journals, tech manuals, everywhere. This is taught as absolute truth. And if you go up against this, uh, you are considered to be a heretic. And they'll make fun of the students, they will embarrass them, they'll do all kinds of things. 
And uh, so that's the way it is. But the biblical account simply says there was a creation, there was a fall, there was murder, man killing man. And then after that, of course, there was a big flood. And after that, there's the Tower of Babel. And after that, there was the call of Abram. Now, I've just given you an outline of the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. You know, we went through this in a fair amount of detail all last year when we talked about the chronology of the Old Testament. And these are what we see the effects of today. But you see, it's the misinterpretation or the reinterpretation or different interpretation of the same information that gives rise to creationism or evolutionism. You remember now the Scopes Monkey Trial, as they call it, down in Tennessee was about the issue of fairness. It's not fair to teach creationism in school and not teach evolution. Did you know that? It's just exactly the opposite of what it is today. And they said to be fair, they must be able to teach evolution in the school. And so they allowed evolution to be started to be te taught in the schools and now that it's entrenched, what do, the, what do the evolutionists say? It is unfair to teach creationism. You see the turnaround? Double standards. Observe, propose, experiment, gather data, formulate. It must be repeatable. The experiment must be. And if your facts are repeatable and acceptable and widely accepted by your peers in the scientific community, it might even become a law. Well, you see, the evolutionists start right here. They formulate their theory, and then they set about to prove it and make it a law. And they don't, they don't do any experiments or anything of that nature. They just simply formulate the theory, and everything has to fit the theory. And that's not scientific at all. Evidence of old age, supposedly, is the greatest evidence are these fossils of primitive man. We've already gone through these. We'll talk about them more later. We've talked about how Neanderthal is homo sapiens, Cro-Magnum is homo sapiens, Piltdown man was a hoax, Java man was the thigh bone of a uh, homo sapiens suffering from advanced cases of rickets, Peking man was the skull of monkeys, Nebraska man was a pig's tooth, and all the African uh, things they're finding in Africa right now that you hear so much about are the remains of monkeys and apes and gibbons. We talked about Miller and Erie's experiment, creating life in the laboratory, and that simply just was not true because we talked about how that uh, in this, this case, this experiment, they had to continuously add new gases here. They had to get something from somewhere. They didn't start with just a certain amount and stay with that. They had to continue to add things. They had to come around here. And they, of course, simulated electricity passing over the primordial, boiling the ocean with these gases present with the electrodes. That's okay. If that's, uh, you know, that's no problem there. But right here is the real problem, one of them. One of the real problems is that after they do this, then they have to put an ice water bath around what they get uh, with a condenser with ice water flowing through it. And I have a little problem with ice water being present during a primordial boiling ocean. And then down here, they had to continually remove the uh, tars from a tra by way of a trap here, or these tars would destroy anything they condensed out right here. Well, that's dishonest because uh, there's no way to remove these things in the primordial system. This took, this took a designer, this took a person to watch after this, this took the pattern maker to be able to furnish the flame, to add the gases, to spark the electricity, and to have the ice water and remove the tar so they could get some primitive prototypes of amino acids, not life. But it was stated in the headlines that they had created life in the laboratory and they did no such thing. And then, of course, carbon dating, we talked about that. And we talked about how the water in at five gallons a minute, water out at four gallons a minute, how much you accumulate water at the rate of a gallon a minute. And then you shut the faucets off and then you measure how much you have. And that's according to the half-life of carbon. Uh, that's, uh, you know, determined to be the age. Now the water in this is just an illustration of how this is. This is really C14 in, C14 out, accumulation of C14. And uh, we talked about how that they date all kinds of things uh, with different uh, dates. In other words, a living snail was dated at 1400 years old, a carbon dating, you know. And, but those are called anomalies. Anything that doesn't fit is called an anomaly. 
Impossible for the earth to be real old. Why? The magnetic field would have been too hot. Life could not have come into existence if it was just back several 800,000 years old. Cosmic spheres have been too deep. We'd be covered up with 32 miles deep of uh, micrometeorites if the earth was billions of years old. I mean, these micrometeorites come down and they land on the surface of the ground. They're just very small. Comets would have been too big. Comets have certain periods. They come around and they go around the sun and they lose one-seventh of their mass each time they go around the sun. Well, you go backwards. If a comet loses one-seventh of its mass every time it comes, then go backwards. If we're billions of years old, how many times does that comet come into the system? And if you take it back that many trips and add one-seventh mass to it, it's one-seventh bigger each time it came in the past. You don't have to get back very far until that comet would have been so large, it would have totally swept the sun, moon, I mean the sun, our uh, sun, moon, and our planets totally out of our system. It would have just swept the sun away. It would have been so massive. And we talked about stalactites in caves. And we talked about those four-inch stalactites underneath the bridge over at Clear Creek and the 26-inch stalactites in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. And if a stalactite grows at the rate of an inch every thousand years, actually it's slower than that. Well, let's say a stalactite just grows at an inch every thousand years, then if that means our bridge at Clear Creek, if it's got four-inch stalactites under it, our bridge is 4,000 years old. And the, and the, and the Lincoln Memorial is how old? With a 26-inch stalactite hanging in the basement, how old is that system? 26,000 years old. And doesn't matter what anybody else tries to tell you, I'm telling you about evolutionary scientific thought process, the Lincoln Memorial is 26,000 years old. Helium flux, less than 10,000 years. Carbon-14, less than 35,000. Cosmic spheres, about 10,000. Magnetic field has to be less than a million years old. Nickel content has to be around 7,000 years old. Quantum algebra, putting all the formulas in, figuring it out, says it's less than 10,000 years old. In other words, all these scientific uh, evidences tend to point uh, to a very young Earth. And here we have the system of uh, photosynthesis and respiration. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. The leaves take in the CO2, let off the oxygen. The leaves of the tree are activated by the sunlight shining through the leaves, picking up water through the roots, carbon dioxide in the underside of the leaf. They make all the food, all the food that's made on Earth starts with this process right here. And not anything can live without this process. Now how in the world do you evolve photosynthesis and respiration at the same time. How do you do it? I'll give you another one. Look how inefficient it is to have male and females. I mean, that's inefficient according to evolutionary, evolutionary thought process. And not only that, human beings are the most inefficient ones of all because we spend so much time having offspring and we spend so much energy in having those offspring and taking care of them and trying to raise them to a time they can take care of themselves to have offspring. That is totally inefficient in evolution. And any system that's like us should never rise to the top of the evolutionary scheme. How in the world did we wind up being on top of the evolutionary scheme? Well, because we didn't evolve. God made us human beings and he put us in charge of everything else. And that's the reason we're on top. Now remember, if, if a person believes in evolution, there's not anything wrong with killing people. There's not anything wrong with abortion. There's not anything wrong with euthanasia. There's not anything wrong with genetic counseling relative to deciding who should live and who should die. Because simply, we're just helping evolution out by survival of the fittest, right? Making sure the best genes survive. Hitler used that. He had on if you realize it or not. Hitler was uh, given this information by an American geneticist, in fact, who advocated these very type of things, evolutionary geneticists. And this is where he got some of his ideals for his super race. A lot of people are not aware of that. And so a lot of times is where you get, where the farther you get away from God, the more and more you start buying into abortion and euthanasia, forced euthanasia, the government having the right to decide a person in a nursing home, uh, you know, in Holland now, in the Netherlands, the government will make the decision to euthanize people because they're getting to be a burden to society. Well, can't you just see where we're headed in our own country? All of our nursing homes, all of our people in it, they're not productive. And we, we keep going into this evolutionary line of belief and everything. 
eventually we'll reach the decision where that, hey, why should we allow all these people to be a burdened society with all this Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance companies and burdens to their families? When a person's deemed to no longer be productive, we simply euthanize them. We're all euthanizing our, our babies, you know, from the womb. We're killing them off. And so if, we, if we've already justified killing the young, we'll justify killing the elderly also. And so uh, that's the balance we have. How did, how did we evolve male and female at the same time? How did we reproduce before we become male and female? Well, you see, if you believe in evolution, you can even accept homosexuality that we're evolving a third group of sexual types, homosexuals. No, we're just perfectly normal. We're just evolving. It's just, it's just part of the game, see? And uh, many, many things can be justified once you get rid of a God. Once you get rid of a, an accountable, accountability to a creator God, once you get rid of him, you can do anything you want to. Because there's no absolutes and there's no morality, there's no right and wrong. And I determine what's right and wrong for me. And if I'm, more, if I'm powerful enough, I can pull it off. Yeah, that's what Mao Zedong and Joe Stalin and, and uh, Adolf Hitler and these people were able to do. They were strong enough and had enough power that whatever they believed, they could force on the people. And that's where Russia's at today, coming out from underneath 70 years of atheism. It's pitiful. And the infrastructure and everything, those people were slave for all those years. All their productivity turned into Olympic Games and space and war machinery. And, and the, the Iron Curtain was not put up to keep us out. The Iron Curtain was put up to keep them in. And it becomes very obvious when you travel there and everything. I think you'll enjoy if you want to borrow that tape, you know, check it out and borrow it. Ray has it. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it if you can devote the time to it and just see those people and you'll, you'll change your mind about Russians. Well, evidence for a global flood, that's where we're headed with all this other thing, you know. Uh, there is, either was a global flood or there was not a global flood. Now, why does the evolutionists deal with this? Well, the people involved with this, they're looking around the earth and they're finding evidences of a lot of water at one time here, a lot of water there, and a lot of water over here, and a lot of water over there, but never at the same time. See, that's the problem. Well, let's look at some of these things and uh, see what we have here. Well, first, let's look at some observations. We've talked about fossils. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to note that fossils are laid down by size, shape, and weight. In other words, you find gigantic fossil beds. You, when you find one dinosaur, you find many dinosaurs' remains together. When you find one saber-toothed tiger, you find many saber-toothed tigers. When you find uh, seashells, you find many, many seashells together. Hundreds of thousands or millions of them fossilized together. Things tend, you don't find things of different sizes fossilized together. You always find uh, fossils uh, by size, shape, and weight. Do you know how that one of the most effective ways of sorting things by size, shape, and weight? Moving water. Rushing, moving water will sort things by size, shape, and weight. Uh, people that have gigantic large orchards have known that for years. That's the way you sort out different grades of apples, different size apples and oranges. You do it, uh, they probably do it different nowadays. They probably use it, uh, computer systems and imaging and sizing. But originally they used running water. And running water would sort things by size, shape, and weight. And that's the evidence we have in these gigantic fossil beds. Things are sorted by size, shape, and weight. And incidentally, we have hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of fossils. Every university I know that's involved in fossil hunting or uh, paleontology, archaeology, geology, and that type of thing. They've got a warehouse full of fossils. At one time, fossils were supposed to be real rare, and they really guarded them all. They've got so many fossils on hand now, they don't know what to do with them. Fossils are very common. Probably we could go outside this church building within five to ten minutes, I could probably find you a fossil. All I have to do is find some gravels, and I'll find you a fossil very quickly, and I'll find you some beautiful fossils. And uh, one of the students brought me a fossil of a trilobite. He picked up on the Kentucky River on a, on a sandbar. 
beautiful trilobite. I'll bring that trilobite in maybe next week or two whenever we talk about that area. And I've got two of those things, trilobite. Another student brought me one from Florida. And this guy's just a little tiny guy about that long fossilized, and he's humped up as if he's trying to get away from something. Well, you think about that. How was he fossilized in the process of humping up? And this other one just fossilized. He's just nice and flat, and you can see all the bumps on his head. You can see the three different sections of his body. That's the reason they call him a trilobite. These things are supposed to have existed a billion years ago and gotten fossilized and buried real deep and all that kind of thing. And my question is always, when these things, things get buried real deep and all that pressure's on them, how do they come out with some of them with, a, with their antenna fossilized? In other words, the actual the antenna on their head are fossilized. Well, that's a very delicate thing. And so fossilization, uh, there are many so-called anomalies by the evolutionists. And we talked already how, how you date a fossil. You date a fossil by the rock you find it in. Well, how you date the rock by the fossils you find in it. And you arbitrarily set the fossils up to illustrate evolution. You start with the invertebrate marine, go to the vertebrate marine, you go to the amphibians, you go to reptiles, then you go to aves, then you go to mammals. Seashells have been found on all the tallest mountains. You can find seashells all over the place up in the mountains. When Darwin went to South America, one of the things that amazed him is when he went into the mountains of Argentina. And uh, he found all these seashells up on the mountain. And he just documented. He, he wrote a lot of things in his, uh, his journals that never showed up in his book. Uh, these, these seashells found in the mountains didn't show, wind up in his books on his uh, theory of uh, evolution on the descent or ascent of man, as you want to call it. Well, Let's look at these wave marks. Wave marks in, in uh, New Guinea or up on the mountains, and it shows at one time the water stood up on those mountains, and the wave marks made wave. You know, the waves made wave marks, and the water level was lowered, and wave wave marks and was lowered, and made wave marks and was lowered, and made wave marks and things like that. You say, well, why couldn't they made wave marks when the water went up? Well, if you read the scripture real carefully, there were no tall mountains before the flood. There were hills, just nice rolling terrain. But the mountains came after the flood as a result of the flood when the caverns of water underneath emptied themselves by water spouts and came to the surface and gigantic amounts of water tearing the earth all to pieces. And then when the weight of the water was on top and these caverns were now emptied of water, the weight broke the earth and so it dropped down and it shoved an upthrust in the other areas, the mountains. And um, all the geological evidence gives rise uh, to this, this occurring, but they claim it occurred over millions and millions and millions of years at the rate of a quarter of an inch every thousand years the Rocky Mountains is growing, you know. And the Appalachian Mountains are being worn down by erosion. We're old mountains, Appalachian. But over in the Rockies, there are new mountains. They're up thrusting and coming up. And this is the continent building thing and the continental drift. And the fact we used to be together one landmass. You see, even in science, they admit at one time, oh, they say, yeah, all land was connected together. But their theory is it's connected together and the continents broke apart and drifting apart. But see, the Bible says it's all connected together. In the fact, there were no oceans. There were just seas. There was only four rivers. And the water came up from underneath the ground and, and watered the earth from these four rivers and from the, the mist that came up from the ground. And the water had to go back in somewhere and travel underneath the earth and come back there in the garden in Eden where the water came out. God had this beautifully well-balanced system. And what happened is he disturbed that system. He broke the earth and he allowed this water that was traveling underneath the earth, the caverns, to come pouring out in these gigantic uh, fountains of water. They call it, I don't know how high they went in the sky. They went high enough to punch holes in the windows of the sky. They went high enough, in other words, to disturb whatever it was that God had designed, that water canopy, and it punched holes, and the water and the water canopy fell on the earth also. And it tore the earth literally to pieces, and that's exactly what we have evidence of today. We have evidence of an earth that has been torn to pieces by water. The evidence is that water has been everywhere. 
the uh, evolutionists just don't like the idea that it's everywhere at the same time because that would be a worldwide flood. Well, on the Sphinx, you know what's interesting? That Sphinx, that, that lion's body with that looks like a Pharaoh's head on it, that head is not the original head. In fact, that's the second or third or fourth head that's been on the Sphinx. The original Sphinx head, we have no idea what it looked like. But we do know one thing, that there's wave marks on the Sphinx. The Sphinx just might be a pre-flood structure. And that when the floodwaters went down, it left wave marks on the Sphinx structure. Now, it's going to be very hard in a few years to see those wave marks. You'll have to get an old picture of the Sphinx because the Egyptian government is recovering the Sphinx with nice, smooth granite, I guess it is. It's going to be nice and smooth. And they're not doing that to hide the wave marks. They're doing that to preserve it because it's such a big tourist attraction. And uh, already by... Uh, echograms and things, whatever, how they do that, sonograms or whatever. They know that there's a chamber down between the Sphinx's two front feet. And they will not allow any archaeological digging there because they're afraid to disturb the Sphinx and it might collapse. And boy, in Egypt, you're just not going to do anything that's going to collapse the Sphinx or harm a, uh, a pyramid or anything of that nature. But, the, but it sure looks like the Sphinx is a pre-flood structure. And the head was knocked off. No tell them where the head wound up at when that flood turned the earth up. And then they put new heads on it. And it would appear that this probably was some type of uh, temple or something of that nature. So it could have been a pre-flood structure like that. Well, let's go a little farther. Let's talk about something called the continental shelf. Continental shelf. Around all continents, several maybe several miles out in the ocean, is another seashore. In other words, if we have the seashore today that's like this, there's another seashore that's out underneath the ocean. So the evidence is that the ocean level was much lower at some point in the past. Now, if you take the water down to that level, all the land will be connected together. In other words, if you take it down. So post-flood, I feel that what happened is the continental shelf is actually the continental line after the flood. When the flood waters went down, the flood waters ran into the lower areas and some of it ran back into the ground. And we still have a lot of flood water out there. It's called the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, the India Ocean, the Antarctic Ocean. That's the flood water. Where did the flood waters go? They're still there. Because God, it says, Cause the uh, the bottoms to fall out of the mountains and the water ran off and uh, the water went down and it had established this continental shelf here. That was the ancient shoreline that we talked about. And uh, this continental shelf, uh, the reason that water's not out there today is because after the flood was over, climatic conditions were such it had a tremendous onset of what's called the ice age. And the ice kept uh, uh, freezing the water into ice, and that's the reason why the flood level is down at the continental shelf. But with the tilt on the earth and our orbit around the sun, and now we have seasons, because that's what it says after the flood was over, that uh, God established seasons after the flood. There was no summer, winter, spring, fall before the flood. It was all semi-tropical everywhere. There was no deserts. There were no gigantic high mountains. There was no tornadoes, there was no hurricanes, there was no flooding. Uh, there's none of these things before the flood. All these climatic conditions come after the flood. And so when the ice cap started melting, the water started coming up, and the water's still coming up. It's coming up today. We're still getting meltdown, and the water coming up, and that's the reason why the water is higher now, and the continental shelf, the old seashore, is far out at sea. But if you take that water down to the continental sea shelf, all land mass will be connected together, and that's how people distributed to all continents after the flood. The continents haven't spread apart. How in the world could we have this earth here, and all the water all the way around here, and all the land right here? Our earth would be so out of balance, it would wobble in such a way that uh, I don't know what would happen to the earth. It looks to me like it would wobble and vibrate. And life couldn't even exist on it. It would probably fall apart or something. But this thing about the continents spreading apart, 
and that uh, we're splitting and these, these continental things, these plates, tectonic plates are colliding with each other and they're going under each other and above each other and that's what causes earthquakes and everything. The cause of earthquakes is because God caused the first earthquake and he broke the earth at the, uh, at the uh, great uh, rift earthquake fault line which goes from South Africa all the way up through Africa all the way through the Red Sea comes all the way up the Aquaba comes through the Dead Sea comes up part of the Jordan River turns to the west and goes underneath Jerusalem and goes into the Mediterranean Sea and that's the reason why in the latter times it says what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back on the second advent and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and it's going to split and part's going to move to the north, and part's going to move to the south. There's going to be a great split. And also he's going to have his seat into the millennial temple. And the water's going to come from underneath the temple. And it's going to flow out. And it's ankle deep, waist deep. It's shoulder deep. And it gets very deep. And it'll hit this great crack. And it will flow to the west. And it'll flow to the east. And it will purify all the waters of the earth. By going to the east and the west through that great crack today we call the great rift. God's going to open that back up. Uh, when he comes back in a second advent. And uh, so that's one of the things that's going to happen. Why does the waters have to be purified? Because we just had a tribulation. And if you look at the tribulation, one of the things that happen is that the oceans and the water totally get contaminated. The air gets contaminated, the soil gets contaminated, the water gets contaminated, and uh, two-thirds of life on earth ceases to exist. And it's terrible, terrible conditions. Terrible conditions. Well, also, we have all these ancient stories. The Babylonian flood epic. A hero, a boat, took some people on board, took some animals on board, outlasted the flood, and he rescued them. And that's in the Babylonian uh, epics. And uh, so a lot of people says when they look at this, you know, they say, well, the Bible borrowed that story from the Babylonian epic. Well, why can't it be the other way around? Why can't it be that the Bible reports the true story and as man gets farther and farther away from God, he forgets exactly the right story and he invents his own story that a God somewhere rescued the people during a big flood. And uh, then they have one called the Sumerian Deluge. And in this one, again, we have a hero. And uh, this hero and a boat, he was told to build the boat. And, and uh, what happened was uh, his God told him to do this and he did it and he rescued the people. Then we have a uh, uh, Deucalion flood epic, the Greek story, and it's basically a repeat of these. Then we have this tale of uh, Samothrace. That's an island in the Aegean Sea. Now the Aegean Sea is that sea that's between Turkey and Greece. And you go up that, and you'll go through what's called the Dardanelles, and you'll go between uh, Istanbul and the rest of Turkey, and you'll go into the Black Sea. And uh, so this, uh, this tale was thought to uh, come off of the flooding of the Black Sea. Now, how many of you all heard the recent information on the flooding of the Black Sea? Well, let's talk about that just a little bit. Remember now we talked about we talked about how that the after the flood we had all this flood water out there and we had these continental shelf where the, the it was located. Remember we had a lot of ice build up in the ice age after the flood, but now it's starting to melt. Now what's called today the Mediterranean Sea. The scientists have found out that at one time the entire Mediterranean Sea was a below the sea level desert. And that Gibraltar, the one opening from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic, it was standing like a dam there. In other words, the water was up, say, this high in the ocean. It was at this high in the ocean, but the basin was down here, what's now the Mediterranean Sea. So the, what's today the Mediterranean Sea was a basin way below sea level. And it was like our Death Valley, so far below sea level, that lies a horrible place. And this is documented in old history that uh, you know, people used to think this was all just uh, baloney, I guess. But now they're coming to find out some of these old histories are pretty accurate. People just wrote what they observed, you know. They didn't try to manipulate anything. Well, as the ice melted and the water got higher and higher, it finally spilled over 
like a waterfall. This is called the waterfall of Gibraltar. And the water started pouring over from the ocean and started filling up the Mediterranean. Well, the Mediterranean filled up. Life wasn't very inhabitable there anyway, so it's no great big deal. And it probably took quite a few years to fill it up. So people were not too many there, not too much civilization, no problem. But then the problem is when you come up through between Greece and Turkey and you come up into the Dardanelles, as this water came up, there's another area here that's sort of like a dam and the water was getting higher and higher on it. And here was the Black Sea Basin. Now this was a small freshwater lake with many villages around it. And so this water was coming up at, you know, who knows what rate, but people probably observed it, and it started trickling over this, what we would call a natural dam, sort of like Cumberland Gap, you know, a low spot in the mountains, and it spilled over it, and it started filling up the Black Sea Basin. Salt water for fresh water. People living there. Well, this would have been, once this got started, it cut a dam through there, this started coming through there at the rate of uh, 40 times the water that comes over Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, a lot of water. It would be coming up to where it, uh, it would come up at the rate uh, of probably about uh, four inches a day to fill that basin. So that's pretty, pretty much of water, four inches a day. The people right on the front side, if they didn't try to escape when that water first breached that and cut its opening through there and came through with that uh, ferociousness, uh, they would have been just churned up and drowned and everything else. But over in the northeast side of the Black Sea, the people would have heard this tremendous roar, the earth shaking for weeks and months, and all of a sudden the river quits flowing, you know, into the lake, or the lake rather, it starts draining uh, like this and it becomes brackish water and it's starting to mix with uh, seawater and everything and the water comes up and this is actually in recordings in history which they ignored for a long time these people started moving out of this area and they started moving all around Europe and they all carried a story of a big flood and the thing about it this was a big flood it totally filled up and is called today the Black Sea and uh, so everybody now is running around saying, well, the, if the event in the Bible is based upon the flooding of the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, when in essence all they're doing is showing us the meltdown of the ice and the raising of the ocean levels, the abandonment of the old continental shelf, you know, the coastline, the establishment almost every year of new coastlines with the water coming up higher and higher, and our oceans are going to get deeper and deeper. And so that's exactly what has happened here is that these are results of the great, after the great flood, just like the formation of the Grand Canyon, the great gigantic ancient sea behind the Kalbab Plateau, which acted as a dam. There was a leak and the water started leaking through it. And it, you know how water, once it starts breaching a dam, it cut its way through the Kalbab Plateau and made what today we call the Grand Canyon and probably that ancient lake when it emptied through that natural dam and it breached the dam, the Grand Canyon was formed probably in no less than a month or two. And that just blows your mind because you've been told it took hundreds of millions of years for the Colorado River to cut that. Well, time's up. We'll talk about the Colorado River later. And uh, let's just make sure though that uh, we understand that there was a telling of one story right here if I can get my overheads apart, the magnetic. The storyteller, 1700 BC, documented, and he gives a poem right down the line of the biblical account. Now, the biblical account, and we'll talk about this later, of course, is Genesis 6 through 9. And from there, We'll go to our last overhead one more time, the way we want to end up every time. The evolutionist says if you think about it long enough, it has just bound to have occurred. Well, they've even borrowed this from Psalms 119.11. You know, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In other words, we're to think about creationism in our heart. And we'll continue this. It, uh, we'll just keep 
reviewing and adding to each time. 